Welcome to the Baltic University and session number nine of our course, the Baltic Sea Environment. Today we are broadcasting to you from the Himmelfjärden wastewater treatment plant just south of Stockholm. This plant receives the water from about a quarter of a million people and several larger and smaller industries. And all the water is coming to this hall about 50 meters below ground level. Then it's pumped up to the treatment plant and after treatment let out into the Baltic Sea. Uh, today we are going to discuss water and wastewater management in the Baltic region and of course the uh, treatment plants are central in this discussion. We will start with a short introduction to the topic. Originally men took his drinking water from wells or as surface waters in rivers. The used water was poured back into nature on the site where, where it was used. The natural purification processes took care of the pollutants, which served as nutrients for plant and microbial life. In the growing cities, the water situation came to be more difficult to handle. Toilet waste was originally transported away to fields, but even in ancient times, sewers were built to use running water for the transportation of waste. The sewers emptied into the river. Without sewers, the wastewater was just emptied on streets or again into the rivers. But polluted wastewater carried diseases and contaminated the fresh water supplies. The linkage between water pollution and waterborne diseases was established last century. In 1854, an English physician, John Snow, clearly traced the outbreak of cholera epidemics in London back to the River Thames, which was grossly polluted with raw sewage. To control waterborne diseases, it is necessary to separate sewage from the drinking water supply. This is illustrated by the close relationship between the death rate from waterborne diseases and water consumption from the water net, valid for Stockholm over a long period during the 19th century. During this time, the separation of sewage and drinking water was not efficient. Wastewater management was initiated to protect the inhabitants of cities from waterborne diseases. Sewer systems led the wastewater to recipients such as large lakes or the sea itself, far away from the fresh water supplies. The wastewater was left to be treated by natural purification. Only a mechanical step to remove large objects was sometimes constructed at the outlet of the sewer. The solution to pollution was dilution. But with increased volumes of waste, the capacity of the recipients was not sufficient. Lakes became polluted, mostly eutrophied. Bacterial contamination of beaches and algal blooms signaled the need for a new step in water management. Wastewater treatment plants were built to decrease the content of organic pollutants in the waste. Biological steps were designed to deal with this problem. The measures were again sufficient for a period, but with large volumes of wastewater and the introduction of phosphate-containing detergents, the recipients were polluted by phosphate. A chemical step was designed to precipitate the phosphates at the treatment plants and reduce phosphate levels in the water, leaving the plants to save the recipient water. The next problem involved the poisoning of animal and plant life by toxic wastewater from industries. Here, high concentrations of heavy metals and toxic substances were the challenge. Modified treatment methods were developed to reduce the content of toxicants in the water. Other important ways to deal with the problems are decreased use of toxic chemicals in the production process and recycling of the chemicals. Today, the next and ongoing concern in wastewater purification is the removal of nitrogen from the wastewater. This is already being done at many treatment plants using biological methods, such as nitrification and denitrification by a bacteria. Wastewater treatment will continue to respond to new problems as they arise. The removal of waterborne diseases from drinking water, the remedy of eutrophied recipients, and the removal of toxic wastewater constitute the first steps in a development that is similar in many countries. The wastewater treatment plant is below our feet and we can see all the tanks used for the various treatment steps. Further out you can see the bay, Himmerfjärden. The outlet from the plant is one and a half kilometers away. We have collected today's panel outside here in the rain. 
the coordinator of the session is Bengt Hultman. Bengt is an associate professor of the Department of Water Resource Engineering at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Our host is Alf Göran Dahlberg. Alf Göran is the director of the Himmelfjärden plant and is also quite active in international work for improving wastewater treatment. Gunilla Brattberg is technical director of Stockholm Water. This city-owned company provides Stockholm with water and takes care of its wastewater. Elsh Bieta Poaza is a postdoctoral fellow with Bengt Holtman at the Royal Institute of Technology. But she has worked for many years at the Department of Water Engineering of Krakow University of Technology at Krakow in southern Poland. She did her PhD research at Himmelfjärden is thus quite familiar with the plant. Finally, we are happy to be able to welcome Rein Munter from Tallinn University of Technology. Rein is a professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, where he works with questions of water purification. You are all welcome to the session. Before starting the session, I would like to mention one new initiative taken by the students at Stockholm University. They suggest that a network of students taking part in the Board Environment course is created and they want to react to this idea. So please, if you have an idea on how to build such a network, please write to them at the uh, Stockholm Center for Marine Research or send them a fax. So we will see what's going to happen. Uh, the program of today will start by an overview of how water flows in nature, in the world and of course in our societies. Then we will continue and discuss water purification first the natural way and then how it's done in a treatment plant. We will then see how this is today made in some major cities around the Baltic Sea. trip in the region is time for the music. And then we look into some special questions. First of course how industry treated and then also the mine waters then go on to the rural situation, water in agricultural areas and uh, then we will discuss investment programs. There are quite some extraordinary sums of money being invested in various countries in wastewater management. And then finally we will discuss the long-term problems and possible solutions to them. But now we will start by our first is the flow of water in nature. All water on Earth is in perpetual motion. It is the sun, or rather the heat from the sun, which constitutes the driving force for this movement, which is called the chemical water cycle. From the sea, from lakes, or from all wet areas, the water evaporates through the heat from the sun. At higher altitudes, the moist air so produced forms clouds. From these clouds, water precipitates as rain or snow. The rainwater, or the melting water from snow and ice, flows off the surface and forms the so-called surface water. In turn, this surface water forms small creeks and rivers and lakes, such as those you can see behind me. The water finally flows into the sea, and the water cycle is closed. A part of the rainwater and melting water can percolate down through small channels in the soil or cracks in the rock, and it then forms groundwater. All the small crevices and cracks which exist in soil and rock down to a depth of several thousand meters are filled with groundwater. As we see, there is plenty of space between the soil particles and gravel and between small stones and clay. In the space between the soil particles, the groundwater can move, and of course it moves at different speeds depending on the size of the crevices. In clay, it is often a matter of only a few millimeters per year, or perhaps even less, while in gravel and between larger stones, it might move several meters per year but it is all the same, a slow movement. The speed of groundwater might be important to know when we wish to study how fast, for example, pollutants percolate to and spread through groundwater. The direction of the groundwater flow depends on several factors. 
more water will flow into regions with porous soil types and along cracks in the rock, and new surface water will more easily percolate into the groundwater in such places. It also depends on the topography of the region. If, like here, we have a high hill covered by fairly porous soil, then large volumes of water might flow downhill. Then wells are easily formed in the valley where the groundwater is pressed to the surface. This completes another leg of the water cycle. It's true that there is a lot of water on the earth, but still uh, only a small fraction of it is fresh water. Access to fresh water, and in particular clean fresh water, is a very serious global problem. And we need to see the situation in our own region in this perspective. We went to the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm and asked John Erik Gustafsson about his point of view of this problem. Well, the water resources uh, on the earth are limited. On a global scale, we have uh, about 40,000 cubic kilometers of water. But of this amount, only 9,000 cubic kilometers, or one-third, is um, uh, available, economically available. And the, the actual consum consumption or total withdrawal is only one-third of these uh, 9,000 cubic kilometers. What is it used for? Uh, of these um, 3,000 cubic kilometers used, 80% is actually used for irrigation purposes, especially in developing countries. Uh, the situation is very different in different areas of the world. Yeah, for instance, in uh, the Arab countries, uh, water is actually a political problem. In, for instance, uh, uh, south of California, you have to transfer water from other areas uh, often at uh, high cost, mm. and uh, uh, in, in some other parts of the... In China, for example, yes. where you have been doing research. Yeah. If, if we take uh, Chengdu City as an example, it's a city with nine million people. Um, this city is depending on, on a river, and uh, uh, in the last decades, the water flow in the river has diminished 90%, so the city must use practically all water in that mm -hmm. river. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, if we look at the quality of water... Well, if, if we take this uh, river as an example, the, the water quality is really bad, and uh, the authorities have, be, have been forced to shut down, for instance, uh, two water supplies, and uh, there are no fishes in the river. Mm -hmm. What about waterborne diseases? Is it a hygienic problem also? Yeah, in uh, most countries in the developing world, I think this is the main problem for uh, children, deaths, infant deaths and so on, because water is a transmitter of uh, diseases. diseases yeah. If we go to our own part of the world, the Baltic region, what is the situation here? Well, in, in Sweden, uh, uh, the situation is quite good. We have about uh, 180 cubic kilometers. Uh, kilometers of water and we only use less than two percent of this mm -hmm. yes and what about the other part of the region M maybe we could take Poland uh, as an example in Poland they only have one third of the Swedish wa amount of water resources but uh, there are many more people they are about five uh, times uh, more people than in Sweden and this means that they have much more intense uh, water management problems. Mm -hmm. I think Poland and Sweden are the two extremes in the Baltic region. Sweden and perhaps Finland with a very good water situation and Poland with a rather more difficult water situation. Uh, since we have Rain Munter here, we should ask you, Rain, what is the situation in Estonia? <coughs> the total water consumption uh, in Estonia is about uh, 3,000 million cubic meters per year and about uh, 2,700 cubic meters is used uh, for cooling and in industry. It's about 90%. Mm -hmm. So, and Poland again, Ella, do you uh, agree that you have serious problems? Or? Yes, uh, our problems mm. are growing up uh, all the time. And uh, uh, surface waters are the main sources for drinking and industrial uh, water supply in many uh, regions. 
and the quality of water in Orizo is becoming worse and worse. So access um, to the uh, clean water, good quality, is the main problem. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at this a uh, little more systematically, Gunilla, what would you say? You are the one who is uh, used to provide us with water. Where, where does it come from? Yes, in uh, Sweden, about 50% uh, of the fresh water comes from uh, surface water mm -hmm. and uh, about 25% uh, from groundwater. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest, 25%, uh, is uh, uh, surface water which is uh, artificial infiltrated in the mm -hmm. ground and then used for uh, drinking purposes mm -hmm. and so on. And the situation is different in different parts of the Baltic region, I guess. They have in Poland, perhaps more surface water is used. Yes, it's mm. uh, quite different in mm. different parts of the region. Mm. Uh, now, what we do we use the water for? Uh, mm. About 30% uh, is used in urban areas, and mm. then including urban industry, and 65% uh, for uh, more heavy industry. Mm -hmm. And uh, then a very little part for irrigation, about uh, 2%. Mm -hmm. And uh, the resting 3% is used in rural areas. Mm -hmm. So um, if we, yes, the, it's uh, a little different again in different areas of the Baltic region. For example, Estonia, it, it sounds like, as Rain says, there is more industrial use of water than household. Yes. Now, if we want to have a very rough estimate, I understand that a person is using some half cubic meter of water per day. So uh, when we talk about this figure, it's very good to have the uh, relationship between water usage in terms of uh, cubic meter per day and the number of people. Uh, yes, in Sweden mm. uh, we use about uh, two, 200 liters per person a day. Mm for uh, consumption and uh, I think in the uh, in the Baltic countries uh, they use a little bit more mm. and uh, the same for Poland I think. Yes. Do you know about that uh, mm. Ella? Uh, so we use about uh, 300 liters yes. mm. per person per day. So then if we add on the industrial usage we will end up with about half a cubic meter per day and uh, person. So these uh, concepts could be summed up in something that we call the water consumption cycle. In this water consumption cycle, of course, we can see that water is coming in on point A and leaving on point B. Bengt, uh, what's your comment to this? Yes, uh, <coughs> point A is where water enters the society and be the point where it leaves. And hopefully there is a treatment plant at B, but not always. Uh, now, if there is much water compared to usage, the drinking water quality will be good. But with a relatively high usage of water, the cycle will tighten. And the water quality decreases, or we have to increase our efforts to purify. Mm -hmm. This is the situation, as we heard, for Poland. Mm -hmm. Then you end up in Poland, you can calculate the um, water consumption as something like close to 20% of the accessible water. Yes, and that's mm -hmm. the point where, mm -hmm. where there will be shortage of water. Mm -hmm. I think we have a sign that will show these um, very tight water cycles that will uh, be the result of the intense water usage. Yes, mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, the more intense we must treat the wastewater much better and we can solve that by waste minimization or by better wastewater treatment. Mm. In general, if we look at the problems connected with water in the Baltic region, um, I think we have three kinds of categories of problems. Perhaps we should first of all mention the problems with hygiene, and then also, secondly, the problem of uh, eutrophication, too much nutrients, and thirdly, the toxic substances. Um, what could we do about these problems? You are now a water engineer, so what would your solutions be to these problems? Yes, I would like to yeah. well, have both waste minimization and better wastewater treatment. So you say that wastewater treatment is at least one key um, area in the Baltic region today? Oh yes, certainly. Mm. 
So uh, that's what we are going to discuss uh, most of our session. And uh, we will start that by uh, taking a rather natural point of view to see how wastewater is treated in nature. When polluted water, urine and fecal matter, food refuse, etc. are left in the open, several processes are active in returning the matter to nature. This is part of the eternal natural cycles. In the end, nothing disappears, everything is recirculated. Most of the processes are biological. Microorganisms actively metabolize organic matter turning it into carbon dioxide and water and in part into their own biomass. Nitrogen compounds are oxidized by microorganisms in a process called nitrification. The nitrate formed is used as a nutrient but may also be further transformed into atmospheric nitrogen in the process of denitrification. Chemical purification methods are also important. Phosphate, for example, forms insoluble salts and precipitates to the bottom of lakes. Ferrous iron oxidizes in water and precipitates as insoluble ferric salts. In the oxygen depleted bottom, hydrogen sulfide reacts with all heavy metals to form insoluble salts in the bottom sediment. In fact, this is the way in which the minerals in our own mines have formed during millions of years. Also, limited acidification is dealt with by chemical processes in nature, which neutralizes the acids with lime, for example. Physical mechanisms are active when by simple adsorption on clay particles, many fat-soluble pollutants are precipitated. This happens to aromatic organic compounds. Light is also important in the natural degradation of several organic compounds. Water that has undergone natural purification is therefore nat normally quite clear and clean and suitable for drinking by man and animal. So I understand that the main procedure in nature is that the pollutants are transformed into biomass. Uh, would you say, Bengt, you agree on that? Yes, and uh, we have a good uh, self-purification if the capacity is enough in the recipient. Mm -hmm. And if it's not enough, then it will become polluted, I suppose. Yes, mm -hmm. and we can look at the larger area and we can see even the Baltic Sea. and. Uh, in this case, we have seen a lot of deterioration of water quality. So the Baltic Sea is also, I mean, a large region for water purification. But uh, why isn't the water purified? And uh, mm. Yes, we have not the capacity to do it in a small volume. So that is uh, something that we must think of. We have the same biological and chemical and physical steps, but they are not enough uh, effectiveness in the Baltic Sea. So uh, if you see the Baltic Sea as a whole as a uh, wastewater treatment plant, so to speak, then you understand that the capacity is not enough. Now, let's go to uh, ask ourselves, how do we increase the capacity? Yes, that's mm. something for engineers. And we need to have aeration, chemical precipitation, and so on. Mm -hmm. And by that way, we can diminish the volume need by perhaps a factor of up to 100. Uh -huh. so when we come to uh, urbanized areas, it's of course quite obvious that uh, the natural processes are not enough. And uh, to handle that, one has been building wastewater treatment plants, such as the one we have outside our windows here, of course. But uh, there is also one in Uppsala, and to find out how such a plant is working, I actually took Bengt with me to the wastewater treatment plant in Uppsala. We are now downtown Uppsala, and as, as you understand, Uppsala has a large system of sewers below ground, and all these sewers are connected to the small houses. What kind of house is this, uh, Bengt? This building is a pumping station, and the uh, wastewater flows by gravity to the pumping station, and it's lifted about 15 meters up to the ground level and then again flows to a wastewater treatment plant by gravity. 
I see. And uh, how much wastewater can such a pumping station handle? Uh, the pumping station serves about 30,000 persons, and this means uh, 15,000 cubic meters per day. Now we are inside the pumping station. Wastewater flows into this space and is lifted up by seven pumps up to ground level. We are now at the wastewater treatment plant in Uppsala. Bengt, what are we standing on here? Uh, wastewater from all pumping stations are coming to this point. It's uh, about 130,000 persons connected to this point. And some industry, I guess, also. Yes, uh, uh, about equivalent to 40,000 persons. Uh, the treatment starts with a mechanical step in which larger objects are removed by a screen. And what's happening with this, uh, this tank? It is transported by a screw, transported uh, to a press and then to a landfill. Here we have a second step in mechanical treatment and it is an aerated uh, grid chamber. Sand and uh, other heavy particles settle to the bottom and are pumped away. Okay. This is the last step in mechanical treatment and is a pre-sedimentation basin. In this basin, particles sedimentate to the bottom and are transferred to a thickener. And what's happening with the water that's coming in the channel here in the middle? This wastewater is transported to a biological step. This is an, <coughs> a traditional activated sludge process. Uh, the treatment starts with an aeration basin where organic material is oxidized to carbon dioxide and water. What is actually the activated sludge? It is a uh, flux by bacteria and protozoas. So they are doing the job for us? Yes, they are oxidizing the organic material. And growing, I guess? Yes. It becomes more and more of the sludge. That's the reason why one must remove sludge and uh, transfer it to a thickener. The activated sludge is separated from water in secondary sedimentation tanks. Part of the sludge is recycled to the aeration basin and part is removed as an excess sludge. So we have come now to the final step in the purification. This is the chemical step. Yes, and in this step uh, ferric chloride is added and uh, the precipitated flocks are getting larger in flocculation basins just to have better possibilities to separate the flocks. What do, you, what do you separate in this step? The main purpose is to remove phosphorus, but we also remove some other impurities like suspended solids. So after this third step, the end result is the outgoing water, and that's coming just under us here. It's going out to the river Furis. And how much more clean is this water compared to the ingoing wastewater? We have at least removed 95% of organic material calculated as BOD and 95% of phosphorus. The solid residues in all three steps, the mechanical, the biological and the chemical, is collected into a sludge. And this is what it looks like when it leaves the treatment plant. What hap what's happening to it before it comes to this stage? Uh, what has happened is that the sludge has been thickened and after that transferred to a digester. Where the sludge is stabilized and after that the sludge is dewatered. So that was Uppsala, but now we are sitting in Himmelfjärden treatment plant, so we should ask uh, Alf Jöran, who is directing the plant, if it's working the same way as the Uppsala one. 
Yes, mm. um, the only uh, difference is that we handle a little bit more uh, wastewater and uh, we have a sophisticated control system to take to see what's happening in the process and uh, you can see that on the, on the screen. Yes, and uh, now you have computerized the whole treatment plant or? Yes, we have, mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, collecting data for, for seeing all the parameters mm -hmm. that is used for the, um, the control of the plant. Mm -hmm. So you have the flow of mm -hmm. water, I guess? Yes, and we have mm -hmm. uh, air consumption and uh, the air consumption is, uh, is controlled yeah. by an, its own uh, computer. Mm -hmm. All computerized and uh, that's in the aeration dams. Or? Yes, the aeration mm -hmm. tanks. But now aer aeration or air consumption, oxygen consumption is the basis for this um, parameter BOD or COD that is being used so much. What is it actually? Yes, that's uh, two different ways of measuring the uh, organic uh, substances dissolved in uh, the water, and uh, BOD is a biological. Uh, oxygen demand and COD is a chemical oxygen demand and it's expressed in, uh, in uh, milligrams per liter or grams uh, per cubic meter. Uh, oxygen? Oxygen, yes. And what would it be in organic matter then? Yes, I if you compare for example uh, methanol is uh, uh, 1.2 kilograms of uh, uh, COD per liter. Mm -hmm. So it's about the same roughly? Yes. Mm. Okay, so uh, so much for a modern treatment plant. What about energy-wise? Do you use a lot of energy? Do you use a lot of resources like personnel and chemicals and so on? Yes, in this plant we, uh, we are 43 persons uh, employed here and uh, we use about 16,000 megawatts uh, hour, hour per year and that is equivalent to approximately 800 ordinary villas in Sweden mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and 50% uh, of that energy is used for the main pumping station and uh, one quarter is for the biological treatment and the rest of the energy for the different processes that's going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But I know Gunilla you have some uh, comments on this energy use in treatment plants since you are running another three mm -hmm. plants in the neighborhood here. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will give some figures uh, mm. for the energy consumption mm. in, in the treatment processes. And uh, in Stockholm, for water supply, for pumping of the water to the consumers, and for treating the, wa the sewage water in the plants, the total consumption per year is about uh, 100,000 megawatt hours. Mm. And then, at the end, before we discharge the treated uh, sewage water, mm -hmm. we take out uh, the heat from the water with the heating pumps. Mm -hmm. And uh, the yearly uh, uh, heat taken out is uh, of the origin of uh, 900,000 megawatt hours per year. Mm -hmm. and so it's uh, quite uh, substantial. Yes, mm -hmm. it's quite substantial. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting. I, I know think. that in treatment plants you also uh, uh, generate a lot of um, um, methane, I guess, yes. in the uh, yes, in the, in, in the digesters. We produce what we call in Sweden biogas, mm -hmm. and uh, we produce about uh, four million cubic meters per year, and. Uh, most of it, or oh, here we use it for 50% for heating purpose and uh, for heating the digesters. But in uh, other part, in other treatment plants, they use the rest of the energy for uh, in the heating system in the town or producing electricity or something other valuable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you are using the wastewater as a resource, at least to some extent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so we will now see how wastewater treatment is being handled around the Baltic Sea and we'll start in Denmark at the, in Fredrikshavn. 600,000 Danes living in small villages, diffuse housing and summer houses where the water is not chlorinated 
let their wastewater run into a septic tank and further to a river, lake, or to the sea, or they release it into the soil after imperfect purification. Wastewater from the other 4.4 million Danes and the 6 million person equivalents of industrial wastewater is led to municipal wastewater treatment plants. Friedrich Hamm's central wastewater treatment plant in Saldebaken daily receives wastewater from the entire municipality. We will follow the path of the water from the consumer to the wastewater treatment plant and further on to the outlet in Kattegat. From households we receive, among other things, wastewater from our washing machines and dishwashers, and it is in particular nutrients from food that are added here. From our toilets are added daily large amounts of, to put it nicely, organic material and microorganisms. Also, after each visit to the toilet, some extra waste is added to the sewage system. In Friedrichsham, there are also daily large amounts of wastewater from the fishing industry. Here the wastewater contains primarily organic material like blood and refuse from fish processing, but also some amounts of detergents, for example. From the consumer, the wastewater is led to Friedrichshamn's wastewater treatment plant via a system of sewage pipelines. This sewage system runs through the entire city. Because of the downslope in the pipelines, the wastewater flows by itself. At several spots in the region, there are small pumping stations which serve the function of lifting the wastewater to a higher level of sewage pipelines. The pumping station is a small building in which a simple pump with automatic controls has been installed. At the pumping station, there is the possibility of leading the wastewater directly to a recipient body of water in case of heavy rainstorms or other emergencies. But normally the wastewater is fed into the central treatment plant. There it undergoes three steps of purification before it is released into Kattegat. So I think you recognize most of that from uh, the views of Himmelfjärden and Uppsala. Nagunilla is Sweden and Denmark quite similar? Yes, it's mm. about the same situation in Sweden, mm. I would say, with uh, those three steps mm. and uh, the different, different sources for uh, sewage water. Uh, in Stockholm, for instance, we don't have any fishing industry, but we have a brewery instead. Mm. And that uh, gives us a lot of uh, BUD consuming uh, pollution. We will continue to a, um, an area with more problems, actually, southern Poland. And uh, they have the very heavily industrialized Silesia in southern Poland. The Vistula River, often called the Queen of Polish Rivers, is at the same time the biggest Poland's wastewater recipient. The total volume of wastewater discharged into the Vistula River Basin amounts to circa 10 million cubic meters per day. 10% of the amount is treated biologically. 47% is discharged without any treatment. The Vistula is 1047 kilometers long. It flows across Poland and its basin area within Polish territory is 199,800 square kilometers, which is more than half of the country's territory. Water quality along the Vistula River changes, and therefore the possibilities of using its water for drinking and industrial purposes also vary. In the upper part of its course, which includes the Krakow region, the Vistula is so polluted that its water cannot be used neither for municipal water supply nor for industrial purposes. This sample, taken out from the Vistula River, upstream from the city of Krakow, contains in one liter 2,500 milligrams of dissolved solids, 1,250 milligrams of chlorides, 200 milligrams of sulfates, 2.5 milligrams of phosphates, 3 milligrams of ammonia nitrogen, many toxic organic substances and heavy metals. 
in 1934, it was only 50 mg of chlorides per liter. Let us examine changes of concentration of chlorides and dissolved solids over the last 50 years. The ancient capital of Poland, Krakow, is the biggest city and industrial center of the Upper Vistula Basin. Its population is 800,000 and the city is a big scientific center with 11 universities. Not far from the old town, the biggest Polish steel mill has been constructed. Today, Krakow produces 300,000 cubic meters per day of wastewater. The Tadeusz Sędzimir steel mill, formerly Lenin's steel mill, is regarded as the biggest environmental threat for the region's air, water and soil. It discharges 153,000 cubic meters of wastewater per day. In this way, environmental hazards of the Krakow region add to the Silesian environmental problems. One of the results is the disastrous state of water quality in the Vistula along many kilometers stretch downstream of Krakow. Wastewater coming from 350,000 inhabitants of Krakow are discharged directly or indirectly into the Vistula River and its tributaries. Only industrial wastewater and municipal wastewater coming from 450,000 inhabitants are treated in Krakow. In 1975, the wastewater treatment plant was put into operation in Płaszów. It treats 70% of municipal wastewater. Because of financial reasons, only mechanical treatment and primary aeration has been completed. The plant removes about 50% of organic pollutants and it is not sufficient comparing with 95% required for ecological reasons. Existing main Kraków treatment plant named Płaszów has a design capacity of 130,000 cubic meters per day, which after partial extension was increased to 160,000 cubic meters per day. The plant serves the whole city of Kraków area except Nova Huta Sabal. The present amount of municipal wastewater equals 200 thousand cubic meters per day, considerable exceeding treatment plant capacity. It means that plant urgently needs to be expanded and upgraded for higher effectiveness. Problem of extension and upgrading of existing Płaszów plant is connected with wastewater reclamation for industrial reuse. The city of Kraków were traditionally supplied with water drawn from the Vistula River until 1950. Major industries in Krakow are still using the Vistula River water for cooling purposes in spite of high salination of water <coughs> which is uh, harmful for industrial installation and products. As a more economical solution, alternative to long-distance transport of water from other sources, the water reclamation <coughs> project based on Krakow municipal sewage are <coughs> as a source of industrial water has been undertaken. The treatment plant has to be extended and <coughs> modified for wastewater reclamation. Mechanically treated wastewater is discharged into the Vistula through the Dzwina River, which in fact has now become a sewer. Biological treatment plants have been constructed for two suburban settlements situated outside of the city's sewer systems, but they treat only 1% of the overall municipal wastewater. There is a need for highly effective biological wastewater treatment plants for the city. Wastewater coming from the Nova Huta Quarter, which presently has a population of 230,000 inhabitants, and household wastewater from the steel mill, are presently discharged into the Vistula River without any treatment. The worst of all is the metallurgical coke wastewater coming from wet quenching of coke. 
but this situation should change in the near future. From its spring to its estuary, the Vistula River flows across many cities. From these cities, as well as from hundreds of industrial plants, untreated or insufficiently treated wastewater are discharged into the river. All the wastewater reaches finally the Bay of Gdańsk and causes deterioration of the water quality in the Baltic Sea. The waste load discharged into the Bay of Gdańsk through the Vistula in 1987 was total nitrogen 105.5 thousands of tons per year, nitrate nitrogen 68.5 of tons per year, total organic carbon 311.2 thousands of tons per year, total phosphorus 5.9 thousands of tons per year, phosphates 4.5 thousands of tons per year. The significant share which Poland has in the Baltic Sea pollution results from the fact that Polish territory has more than a half of total population of the Baltic drainage area. Also, 40% of agricultural land of the Baltic drainage area lies in Poland. Well, we should say thank you to Ella and her friends at Krakow Technical University who made this very beautiful um, video for us. It, it's uh, mostly dealing with southern Poland. What yeah. about the rest of Poland? Uh, actually, the Krakow region and Silesian region are the most polluted areas of Poland and a lot of environmental problems uh, must be solved there in the future. But uh, there are many more cities, of course, uh, like Krakow, mm. which have sewage system, mm. but uh, the existing wastewater treatment plants are insufficient. They are mostly hydraulically overloaded or uh, provide uh, only primary wastewater treatment. And uh, I can say that from 830 uh, towns in Poland, mm -hmm. as many as uh, 250 has no wastewater treatment plants at all. And uh, all wastewater, industrial and municipal, is discharged without any treatment into rivers. And in the whole country scale, only 68% of wastewater is treated but only 27% is treated biologically mm -hmm. and 32% is discharged without any treatment into rivers. And uh, the, the, Vistula rivers, the rivers are the Vistula and the, the Odra. The mm -hmm. Vistula and the Odra and mm -hmm. uh, the tributaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, these uh, rivers are the main recipients of the, uh, this untreated or insufficient uh, treated it's wastewater. Water. Mm -hmm. So therefore, more and more rivers have uh, deteriorating water quality. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, it results in deficit of drinking water just now in many regions. So we're back into the tight water yes, cycle. Yes. Mm -hmm. We will continue up to uh, further north, up to Riga, and see what is the situation there. Riga is the biggest city in Latvia, with total water consumption for municipal and industrial needs during the first was 132 million cubic meters. In the Riga Gulf and Daugava River there were discharged 224 million cubic meters of sewage. Riga city was at nearly 1 million inhabitants and developed industry had no sewage treatment plants until the fall of 91st. 27 of 93 biggest cities and towns in Latvia still have no biological wastewater treatment facilities. Only 8% of Riga city wastewater were treating during the last year. The first stage of Riga City wastewater treatment plant were started to operate on the 17th of September 91st. Construction of the plant lasted eight years. The second stage of the facilities have to be finished till the year 1993. Construction is under progress now. Regarding unfinished state of sewage piping system and pumping stations, only 120,000 cubic meter of wastewater is processing now. Active sludge consisting of microorganisms, fungi and worms is working in a biological plant. Activity state for sludge is characterized by amount of different organisms inside sludge cell and sludge index. Sludge index is a ratio between the volume and weight of sludge into a certain period of time. 
The main water treatment plant stage principally is to be compared with live organisms. Bengt, I know you have been uh, working together with the people in Riga. What's your comment on the treatment plant in Riga? Yes, mm -hmm. I think it's a very advanced treatment plant and uh, it has both possibilities for biological phosphorus and nitrogen removal. So it's mm -hmm. a modern plant. And it started just a half year ago, I understand. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we will continue up further north to Estonia and see what the situation is there. What has been really done in the field of wastewater treatment in Estonia? During the last 30 years, for big towns and industrial centers, large sewer systems with purification stations have been created. This is a situation in Tallinn, Kohtlajärve and Narva. Development of the United Sewer System in Pärnu and Tartu is going, now, uh, going on now. Municipal and industrial wastewaters will pass the purification stations in the near future. The Tallinn United Sewer System comprises the area with settlements in the neighborhood and extends up to 20 kilometers. Wastewaters are directed through the deep tunnel along the coastal area to the main pumping station with capacity 440,000 cubic meters per day where they are pumped into the purification station and after treatment are laid to the sea outlet 2.8 kilometers in length into the Tallinn Bay. The wastewater mechanical treatment unit is working since 1981 and consists of screens, grit chambers and sedimentation basins. For phosphorus removal improvement, iron chloride is added to the wastewater before settling. Sludge from sedimentation basins is thickened in the centrifuges or at sludge bed and transported to the dump. Purified wastewater is pumped into the sea. This year will be finished building of the biological treatment units air tank. Removal of the nitrogen from wastewater will be also possible. During the past decade, small purification units have been constructed all over Estonia for treatment of the sewage from small villages and settlements. They are mainly biological aeration units, air tanks. During the period 1970-1990, about 800 small buyer units have been put into operation. The average capacity of one unit is about 100 cubic meters per day. As an example, we can see the small purification unit in Kiel. Here, the pressurized aeration is used. The residual sludge is thickened on the sludge bed, and the post-treatment takes place in the biological ponds. Reina, I understand that you have done quite some efforts the last 10 years or so in Estonia to uh, manage your wastewater much better. What is the situation? Can you swim outside Tallinn, for example? Uh, yeah, <coughs> you know, you can swim, uh, I think, for example, in Pirita Beach. It's about uh, six kilometers uh, from uh, our downtown. Um, and you also can swim uh, in some beaches, maybe 30, 40 kilometers from Tallinn. But it's not recommended to swim, for example, in Pernu Bay. Um, this uh, beach uh, has been closed during, I, I think, about uh, three years because of very high micro, uh, microbiological pollution. Coal index in summer in Pernu Bay has been about a million. Mm. So what's being so done to that situation now? Um, uh, for that uh, situation uh, in Pernu, the water purification plant uh, will be expanded uh, and uh, the total network uh, will be constructed to uh, uh, treat the whole sewage from uh, Pernu city. So the sewers network is not ready yet? Yeah, it, mm. it's not ready now. Mm. We will continue to St. Peterburg, which is the last contribution we have on this tour. 
St. Petersburg is the largest industrial center on the Baltic coast with its more than 5 million of inhabitants, consumes huge volumes of water taken from the Neva, largest river going to the sea. According to some estimates, the total water consumption by the city amounts to 2% of the Neva discharge, or over 1,000 million cubic meters annually. The fresh water prepared for drinking is distributed through a common water supply network. Near a quarter of this is taken up by industry. The rest is used by people for housekeeping, cooking, bathing and washing, and by municipal services. The daily rate of human consumption is thus comparatively high, more than 400 liters per day and person. But then up to 25% is lost due to poor state of the water supply network, old pipes, leakages, bad connections, etc. Another reason is the lack of personal concern, which in turn is caused by practically free consumption. Until recently, the water price was next to symbolic. Before being distributed through the network, the water must be purified. The problem then is that the newer waters come from the eutrophied and polluted Ladakh Lake. But even worse is that all of the five main water stations are situated within the city. Three of them must deal mainly with the pollution brought from Ladega. The two others have their water inlets located downstream from the major city discharge of untreated effluents. One such inlet is posted right near the famous cruiser Aurora. Another one, which serves the main water station, is located just downstream of extremely polluted Ochterjue. The history of centralized water supply goes back to St. Petersburg Foundation. As early as in 1739, some drinking water was supplied through underground wooden pipes. In 1863, a real network was installed. Originally, potable water was distributed without any purification. Only in 1889, the city court took a decision on advanced filtration. Today, 80% of the water is processed by a one-stage filtration in a system installed in the mid of 50s, when newer waters were quite clear. 20% is subject to modern two-stage purification, settling first and inverse filtration next. Chlorine is used for disinfection. According to official sources, purified water meets international standards, such as the World Health Organization ones. But it is common practice to boil water before use, for the reasons of taste and odor, at least. After use, wastewater goes to the sewer network, which is over 5,500 kilometers long and rather old in some parts. The total volume of effluents going to the sewer system annually is nearly 1,200 million cubic meters. It was not until 1978 that the first wastewater treatment had been started. In 1980, less than 10% of the wastewater were undergoing biological treatment. But the capacity of the wastewater treatment plants have grown rather quickly, and today two-thirds of effluents are biologically treated. If we compare these figures with the new river runoff, it means that still nearly 1% of the water entering the new bay and further to the Gulf of Finland is untreated wastewater. Wastewater treatment in St. Petersburg is highly centralized. The main plants are situated on shores of the Neva Bay with their outlets not far from the coast. The city sewer system belongs to the combined type. Sanitary weights, industry weights and storm water are mixed together. There is practically no local treatment of industry wastes. Thus, we have a lot of troubles connected with the treatment of mixed effluents from inhibition of microbial activity to disposal of heavily polluted sludge. Total amount of contaminated sludge which we must get rid of every day is 1500 cubic meters. The water supply and wastewater treatment problems are becoming very serious not only in terms of everyday life and environment protection, but also in socio-economic terms. Today they pose strong restriction on the development of the city. The musicians we have collected here today are perfect for a musical break. They are called Break Even and come from the University City of Linköping. Yeah. Pop, pop. 
I work all day to pay the bills I have to pay And it's sad But still there never seems to be a single penny left for me That's too bad In my dreams I have a plan If I got me a wealthy woman I wouldn't have to work at all I'd fool around and have a ball do 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 Pow! Money, money, money Must be funny In a rich man's world Money, money, money Always sunny In a rich man's world All the things I could do If I had a little money It's a rich man's world it's a rich man's world A girl like that is hard to find But I can get her off my mind Ain't it sad And if she happens to be free I bet she wouldn't fancy me That's too bad So I must leave I have to go To Las Vegas or Monaco and win a fortune in a game, my life would never be the same. Do 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 it's a rich man's world. Money, money, money. Must be sunny. In a rich man's world. Money, money, money. Always sunny. In a rich man's world. All the things I could do if I had a little money. It's a rich man's world. It's a rich man's world. Thank you very much. Break even. In a little while, we'll come to the big money in the investment programs. It's billions of dollars. But before that, we are going to talk about industry. And perhaps the most important topic on industry is the process water, the water that's being used in the uh, industrial process itself. And one industry that, in, especially in Finland and Sweden, is, consumes enormous amounts of process water is the pulp and paper industry. And we have a few pictures from one such uh, plant. Actually, it's in um, Russia, in Sviatogorsk, very close to the Finnish border extremely close on the Finnish border, but there is a treatment plant built by the Finnish uh, construction company. Um, if we look in on this uh, pictures from the Svetogorsk plant, uh, Bengt, what would you say is, uh, how would you comment on this? How much water do they use, for example? Yes, uh, first thing I may comment that uh, there are very many similarities between uh, uh, of um, industrial wastewater treatment and municipal wastewater treatment. And here we see uh, a biological step, and it's uh, quite similar as we have seen in other videos. Mm. This particular industrial plant area consumes 170,000 cubic meters per day. That's equivalent to what kind of city, for example? About uh, 300,000 or a little more. Mm. So it's a really large city. Yes, mm -hmm. and in this case we treat both uh, wastes from municipality and from the industry, and here is from the municipality. Mm -hmm. This is an aerated chamber again, it's an active sludge process? Or yes, mm -hmm. we saw surface aerators instead of diffuse aerators at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And here we have a sedimentation basin for the effluent. What do they remove in the pulp and paper industry effluent? In, in this case, we uh, remove organic material just as in uh, 
municipal wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. You can see here that uh, wastewater is much warmer, but it's the same type of process. Mm -hmm. And what, uh, what is produced here? Is it uh, cellulose? Yes, mm -hmm. so that is the main purpose. And uh, of course, when we pr produce paper, mm -hmm. we, we must need a mm -hmm. lot of uh, uh, waste that must be treated. Mm -hmm. You saw the last thing you saw that was the uh, outgoing water to the Vauxhall Lake that is also the recipient and it's also the source of the water being used in the process. Now some industries, not this one perhaps, use chlorine for bleaching. How do they handle that? I know a lot of chlorinated organic compounds are being released. Yes, that's mm. a quite more complicated problem. So instead of just using external treatment, it's much better to try to reduce at the source to change production technology mm -hmm. and just uh, as a complementary treatment use some uh, other technology like membranes or, and so on. Mm -hmm. And biology, does that work? Do the bacteria eat the chlorinated compounds? They don't eat it, but mm -hmm. they accumulate mm -hmm. it and it is transformed to a sludge. So mm -hmm. we have not solved the problem, just concentrated it. Mm -hmm. Um, so we will look into the next industrial area and that is the cooling waters and uh, one of the uh, types of industrial enterprises that use most of the cooling waters are the atomic power plants and we will see some, uh, um, we will see how this is being handled at the Sosnovi Bor plant. This is just on the other side of the Finnish Bay County from where we just were. Hi guys, the theme of our lecture is Thermal pollution of Gulf of Finland in Leningrad Atomic Power Plant District. Leningrad Power Plant is situated on the shore of the Gulf of Finland, 80 kilometers from Leningrad. The plant cooling system used the brackish water of the Koporska Inlet of Gulf of Finland. The water comes to the plant by a water scoop canal from the depth of 5 meters. The used water is discharged into the gulf through a spillway canal. In still weather or with winds blowing from certain directions, conditions are good for close circulation of water, which engulfs up to two-thirds of a uh, cooler water body area. The power plant discharge water brings about 2.2 by 10 to 6 joules of heat monthly which is comparable with sun heating in summertime. Construction of the power plant has brought about general urbanization of the shore. The town of Sosnovebor and number of industrial enterprises have been built. A great amount of pollutant and biogenic elements started to come to the Koporska Inlet. The intensive anthropogenic thermification has caused a number of negative changes in the natural flora and fauna of the cooler water body. Now, the uh, scientist at St. Petersburg University says that the cooling water is a uh, environmental problem. Do we believe that? Do you uh, have an idea on that, Rain? I think uh, uh, he's right. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, of course, a problem. But uh, fortunately, mm -hmm. still not for Estonia, because um, uh, fortunately, we do still don't have uh, an atomic power station uh, in Estonia. That's, uh, I think uh, it's good because we, uh, we have a big stress from Ignalina, from Lithuania and from mm. Sosnovibor. Mm. But that's not the cooling water that is threatening, eh? Yeah, it's, it's an, uh, um, another problem. Mm. But I know you problem. have problems in Estonia with another type of, the, uh, another type of industry producing uh, phenols. So we will see what you brought yes. with you from, from Estonia on that subject. Oil shale chemical treatment is a main branch of Estonian chemical industry. Estonian oil shale was formed on the bottom of the sea almost 500 million years ago. Nowadays, about 25 million tons per year of oil shale are used at electric power stations, like a fuel, and about 2 million tons are treated chemically, getting gas, oil, semi-coke and water. Shale oil contains about 30% of phenols. Part of them will stay in the semi-coke and get to ash dump. Another part will solve in water during the dry distillation. A remarkable amount of both phenols get to environment 
to the Finnish Gulf and also to the groundwater in Kohtlajärve area. So the drinking water is getting a serious problem there. Wastewaters from the Kohtlajärve and Kivioli oil shale chemical plants are collected together and directed to the Central Biological Wastewater Treatment Plant. Unfortunately, more complicated phenols are very resistant to the bioxidation and the water in the outlet isn't pure. It still contains 40-50 grams per cubic meter of total phenols. This water is also discharged to the Finnish Gulf. There is another up to now unsolved problem. It's connected with the solid residue of the chemical treatment, semicoke. During decades, it has been collected on the high mountains of Ashtam in the large area, about 10 square kilometers. Also, the prevailing part of the coke is mineral matter. There are several water-soluble organic compounds in it. With rains, very toxic, high mineralized wastewater is formed, which cannot be led to the air tanks because of high content of organics, up to one gram per liter. The most toxic compounds in it are different phenols, chrysols, rhizocinols, dead areas due to absorption of this wastewater into ground are expanding from year to year. One alternative treatment method for such kind of wastewater is ozonation. Ozone can destruct phenols to more oxygen-rich non-toxic compounds like formic acid, clearoxalic and oxalic acids, which are biologically oxidizable. To accelerate the ozonation process, sometimes it's useful to combine it with UV radiation or hydrogen peroxide addition, leading to the formation of the secondary oxidants OH radicals. Experiments have shown that ozonation of the phenolic wastewaters is more effective and cheaper than other methods. Rain, I know you developed this ozonation methods. Is it actually being used? Uh, mm. Yeah, we have uh, studied at our department uh, ozonation process uh, during uh, some five or six or more years for different wastewaters and including uh, also wastewaters uh, from oil shale industry. This method uh, unfortunately uh, isn't uh, still introduced. Uh, we have know-how and uh, we have the technology at our department, but uh, we need uh, uh, to have uh, some uh, pilot plant equipment and pilot plant tests that takes uh, money. And it, it needs uh, a lot of money. Yes, yes. Well, let's it's hope it will cheap. be developed in the near future. But I understand it's a serious problem. Yeah, yeah. And uh, mm. to reduce the treatment costs, it's very mm, uh, useful to combine ozonation with another treatment methods like uh, anaerobic oxidation, bioxidation, and aerobic bioxidation mm. for these wastewaters. So, but today it's an unsolved problem. Today it's entirely unsolved problem and uh, about... are coming out into the uh, Finnish Gulf. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a terrible number. Uh, we have uh, counted it, our calculated at our department. Uh, it extends up to 2,000 tons per year of total phenols. Mm. Something else that is being produced in very high amounts is salt in the Polish mines in southern Poland. And the next contribution, uh, we will see what's happening there. The Upper Vistula Basin covers 50,730 square kilometers, which makes 25% of the overall Vistula Basin. This area, with the population of 8 million people, is the most industrialized and polluted region of Poland. Most Polish mines, metallurgical and chemical plants are situated in this region. Saline mine waters from Silesian coal mines are discharged into the Vistula River. This is causing serious salinity of the river. This is a difficult problem to be solved in this region. 
concentration of the chlorides in the main waters may be as high as 42,000 mg per liter. The amount of water being pumped out from the mines comes up to 31 million cubic meters per year. Methods of desalination of these waters are very expensive and energy consuming. Such a plant operates in Dembiensko, where 200 tons of salt are evaporated from 2,800 cubic meters of saline water per day. There is also a concept to transport the saline waters by a pipeline and discharge them into the Vistula below the Dunayets River estuary. Such a solution would be, however, very costly. Salinity of Vistula water is particularly harmful for industry, which uses water for cooling purposes, because such water is chemically active and increases the rate of corrosion of various installations. The Vistula River and its tributaries are the main recipients of the insufficiently treated industrial and municipal wastewater from the Upper Silesia region. The wastewater treatment plant was put in operation in 1989. Its target capacity is 44,000 cubic meters per day. It treats wastewater from two towns, metallurgical plants, oil refinery and other factories. It was quite difficult to understand how much salt it actually is. Yes. Can you give us some more easily understandable figures? Yes. And um, the water, what is living the uh, mm. mines, contains mm. something like 8% salt. Mm. Mm. Twice as much as ocean water. Mm, yeah. Uh, but, for example, uh, outside uh, Krakow city, mm. it is uh, diluted by waters of uh, this river. river. Mm. Mm. And in down to about 0.25% uh, uh, of salt. So that's uh, the same as in the upper end of the uh, Bothnian Bay about. So it's still quite, um, quite brackish water. W what are the solutions being discussed now? How to handle the salt problem? Uh, just now, uh, saline water from coal mines is mostly stored in the reservoirs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is discharged into the river uh, proportionally to the flow into in the river. Mm -hmm. Another solution is desinhalation process. And in uh, this swap basin, it is planned building of a few such uh, desalination plants. Mm -hmm. And this solution uh, is, however, very expensive mm -hmm. and energy consuming. We saw one of them on yes, the Yes, uh, but uh, this mm -hmm. solution, for example, for uh, this swap basin will enable the elimination of about 50% uh, uh, chlorides loads. Mm -hmm and of about uh, 36 uh, sulfate loads in uh, Biswa River Basin. Mm -hmm. the, mm, another solution, uh, which is uh, still investigated, it is to inject saline waters into the ground, into the sound strong, uh, strata, lying about 800 uh, to 900 meters uh, uh, below the ground level. And the water quality and uh, these levels are the same as uh, uh, in the coal mines. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, realistic to pump thousands of tons of um, saline water on that depth? I mean, it will accept it, so to speak? Yes, it down. Come back, get back up? Do no, <laughs> just now it's been uh, proposed uh, to uh, inject uh, saline water uh, to the coal mines. So it is mm. realistic to uh, pump down them mm. back. Uh, thank you. We will see how you will handle it in the long term. We will turn to another problem area, the rural areas, and see how wastewater is handled in these areas where there are uh, uh, very diffuse um, dwellings of people. Well, they have to use a different way. They must find a, a method that is both stable and produce uh, stable results and they must choose a method that don't need so much attention from personnel and so on. It must be self-regulating in some way. So you try to use a very natural method. What you do is you choose a suitable place where you can uh, make the treatment easy. And when I talk about an easy way of treating it, it, it's by using the land, land treatment. 
there are many methods in land treatment, but one of the most common ones is uh, septic tank systems with the infiltration. Is this important quantity-wise? I think it is. For instance, here in Sweden, all our summer houses must use this method to take care of the sewage. And for instance, in the United States of America, more than 50% of the population is served by this treatment method. So it's quite important. What processes are occurring in the land treatment method? Uh, if we take the first step, we take away all the solids in the septic tank. We take, remove it from the water phase and we store it for about a year. Then we have to empty the septic tank. And after that, the water will run through the soil. And almost immediately, only a couple of centimeters down in the soil, we have removed all of the organic matter, for instance. So it's, uh, and further down, the phosphorus is reduced by adsorption to the soil particles. So we get the very good results in an easy, in an easy way. How much space do you need for such an installation? Uh, it depends on the soil, naturally, because you have to remove all of the water. And uh, uh, sand is, of course, best. It, it's easy to transport the water in sand. So you need about 20 square meters for one home if you have sand. And if you have clay, for instance, then you can need a hundred square meters. And um, sometimes the clay can be so tight that you can't, uh, the water won't run off from it. So you have to use a drainage line on the bottom. And then you use sand as the purification media. So it's always possible to make such an installation? I think it is, mm. yes. Mm. What about the other aspect of the rural areas, the farms and the animals? Uh, it could be a much worse problem because you have more uh, animals on the farm. And uh, as a point source, it could be uh, big. But you, have, you try to handle the manure uh, you keep it in tanks and so on, and you try to use it on the farm, on the farmland, but uh, sometimes you put on too much, so you have a runoff of, for instance, nitrogen and phosphorus. So the, it could be a local problem, I think. So the largest rural areas in the Baltic region is uh, in Poland. So we'll take the occasion and ask Ella again what is the uh, um, the situation in the rural areas in Poland? Uh, mm. Improper wastewater uh, management in uh, these areas has become a really big problem in mm. Poland mm. Um, because uh, water supply programs have been uh, implemented in many places mm. but no sewage system uh, has been installed mm. and in increased, uh, it, it resulted in increasing pollution of uh, many recipients. And about 15% of wastewater requiring uh, treatment is discharged from uh, these rural areas uh, and from infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. And for improvement of sewage management in rural areas uh, in Poland, about 8,300 uh, uh, sewage treatment plants uh, must be built. Mm -hmm. And besides this, uh, m disposal of liquid manure from farms uh, has not yet been solved in a proper way. And liquid manure uh, is the major source of organic impurities. Mm. So we it's the problem. Mm. Mm. We know that, uh, of course, the uh, leakage from, uh, yeah. from farmland being fertilized mm -hmm. with the manure mm -hmm. is very extensive. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things mm. must be done in this area, mm -hmm. really. What about Estonia? Uh, you had a uh, few glimpses of how things are being handled on the countryside in Estonia. Um, yeah, we have mm. also problems in, in Estonian countryside. Uh, or from, uh, um, uh, from one hand we have the problems with uh, pure water mm -hmm. because uh, our groundwater 
uh, contains, for example, in uh, southern Estonia, a lot of uh, iron uh, from uh, some uh, areas. Uh, uh, in some areas, it contains uh, too much nitrates. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, northeastern part of Estonia, our well water, groundwater is polluted uh, by gasoline or kerosene from military bases. Yes. Uh, and, uh, of course, from another side, uh, we still don't have a good treatment units for each farm and uh, summer cottage. It's, it's also a problem for, for us. So, um, we are waiting for the whole Baltic region to install their septic tanks. We'll see what's happened, yes. if that is a nice. possibility. But when waiting for that, we will have one more opportunity for the break even to give us a break. Sunlight plays upon her hair. I hear sound of her gentle word, and the wind that lifts her perfume through the air. I'm picking up vibrations. She's given me excitations. I'm picking up good vibrations. Excitations, good, 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 good vibrations, excitations, good, good, good vibrations, excitations. Close your eyes, she's somehow closer now. Softly smile, I know she must be kind. I'm picking up She's giving me I'm picking up Good vibrations Excitations Good vibrations Excitations Good vibrations Thank you very much. Um, we are going to uh, vibrate on here with investment programs in concerning the wastewater treatment. And um, uh, we have one question from a student who are listening to us. It's Ramona Stepanauskas from Vilnius. Although he's listening in Sweden, that's why he has been able to telephone this question to us. It's about uh, what is being done in the Swedish treatment plants in terms of nitrogen reduction. And we'll ask Alfjöran Dolberg about that. I'm sure you are. Yes, we are not, now mm. in an extremely active phase of uh, introducing nitrogen removal processes in Sweden mm. and uh, there are in fact some uh, wastewater treatment plants that have already started up and they are also looking into the possibility of biological phosphorus method. Uh, we have taken a decision here in Sweden that before 1995 all coastal wastewater treatment plants from the Stockholm up to the Norway uh, border around we'll, the Swedish coast. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. will uh, uh, have to reduce the nitrogen total nitrogen to less than 15 milligrams per liter, and uh, we can see, for example, here in the Stockholm area that there is a very um, big investment program going on. Mm -hmm. So it's in terms of billions of EQs or dollars. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two sorts of um, 
criticism against this. One is that most of the nitrogen coming out to the Baltic Sea actually comes from diffuse sources and not um, point sources like treatment plants. Do you have a comment on this? Yes, but mm -hmm. uh, in uh, some areas, just like uh, this area here in Stockholm, the, uh, uh, there is so condensed population of, uh, of people. We, the main source for nitrogen is from uh, the uh, wastewater treatment plant. plants. So he, just here it will be important? Yeah, locally mm. it will be important all over. I see. Another point that has been uh, raised and that is being asked by uh, Ramona Stapanauskas is that uh, in these processes, nitrification in particular, uh, also nitrogen oxides are being released. Um, do you have a comment on this, Bengt? Uh, I think that this problem should be investigated much more, but so far uh, investigations both in Stockholm and Uppsala have shown on very small amounts and we are a little surprised mm. that it has not been more. Mm. The dinitrogen oxide that might be produced in this process is uh, also a, uh, a warming gas. It's a it contributes to the global warming, so that's why it's important to keep track of it, of course. Yes. But it's not alarming, you say? No, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. we think that we can technically control it if it should be uh, shown that later on that these figures are not uh, quite correct. Mm -hmm. but uh, we will continue to look into the investment programs, uh, and that has been uh, um, being suggested in the Helcom Commission. And uh, three weeks ago, you know, there was this very important meeting in Helsinki, and our team from Åbo Academy University made some interviews. And the first one is with one of the directors of the World Bank, perhaps the most important financing institute. You have correctly indicated that the total cost of the investments which have been identified is very large, is indeed huge. It also appears to us that the total financing likely to be available, especially from foreign sources, may not equal the total demand which has been put on the table. And it's because of that that I was telling the ministers in the meeting today that there is a need first to set priorities. They, they need to decide within the countries and jointly so what are the most urgent actions necessary. Secondly, there is a need to see within the resolution of the hotspots what are the immediate actions which can be, can be taken with minimum of cost. So we need to set priorities in that area too. Having done that, um, there is a need to discuss what will be the sources of financing, both locally and from foreign countries. I want to emphasize the need to identify local sources because clearly the total amount of money which is acquired, which is five billion EQUs or more, cannot be generated from foreign sources. All of the countries in the region, the Scandinavian countries, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Denmark, they do not have resources to pay for cleanup of the uh, environmental problems in the ex-socialistic countries themselves. So it will have, be, have to be a common venture where countries themselves will have to generate resources domestically uh, and then there will be need for foreign assistance, including from institutions like the World Bank. I think that the main problem uh, for us, for Estonia, is uh, point sources. We must solve uh, such first elementary things and after that may we can uh, move uh, maybe into these agricultural uh, uh, pollution problems. Because, but uh, now we have uh, many cities without any uh, wastewater treatment. <laughs> and of course uh, we must uh, solve such problems. And after that, of course, this uh, agriculture become quite important. As I said, uh, we consider with uh, this uh, and uh, all the projects, they must be joint common projects and part, uh, of course, uh, must uh, be our investments, our money, and we hope to uh, get some uh, help, some support or assistance uh, abroad, from abroad too, and from the financial support from uh, international uh, organizations. Rain, do you agree with your minister? Uh, yes, I, I agree uh, in general, but I would uh, add uh, to these uh, big cities uh, without any purification system, of course, uh, industrial waste from uh, northeastern area, from these phenolic wastewaters. Mm -hmm.
that is of course counted as a point source also, or uh, several point sources perhaps. Uh, you saw on the map that eastern Germany is one of the most heavily polluted areas in terms of point sources and we took the occasion to ask the German Minister of Environment on how Germany is going to handle the difficult environmental situation in eastern Germany. Yes, we have quite a lot of uh, very hard works to do because we are 40 years without any precautionary environmental policies there. So we started uh, directly where there is an uh, immediate problem for the human health, especially coming from drinking water. So we have a very intensive uh, program investing in better uh, supply of drinking water. We have a very direct uh, problem concerning air pollution. You know that the former GDR was a total lignite state with very poor and very high sulfur content lignite. So they have a very intensive uh, uh, air pollution uh, problem with direct impact to human health. And third, of course, uh, problems combined with chemical industry there and with uh, uranium ore mining. So these are the direct incentive. More than 100,000 people are working in a clean up, what we called as a substitute for labor places in finances. So there are more than 100,000 with clean up problems and we invested something more than 1.8 billion Deutsche Mark for those first projects. What, what, what is the time schedule? We decided that we bring the former GDR, the young U5 Bundesländer, to the same uh, level of precautional environmental policy as in the western part within this decade so that we uh, overcome all those problems within less than 10 years and I think that is a very outstanding timetable. Uh, the, the river problem in, 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 German, in East Germany is, is uh, quite extensive. Like for example the river Orde is, is quite polluted. Uh, what are your plans for the river Orde? Yes, we have two main rivers. It's the Elbe and it's the Oder. Both are international water bodies, so uh, we decided to do quite the same what we did on the Rhine River years ago. We have an international commission for the cleanup of the Rhine coming from Switzerland to the Netherlands and we did a very good job there. The Rhine is really uh, in a good position now. So we uh, do the same with regard to the Elbe. We have already an international Elbe Commission with the Secretariat in Magdeburg, we make a coordinated priority uh, cleanup program. We will sign this in the next weeks in Prague, with, together with the Czechoslovakia, uh, also with uh, the European Commission. And we are uh, in negotiation now with Poland, with Czechoslovakia, with the European Commission in Germany to come to a comparable commission for the order with the Secretariat in Breslau. Uh, I had just a discussion with my Polish or new Polish colleague some days before and we hope that we can sign this agreement in May. Germany is not so directly involved. There are the most uh, polluting uh, places are in Poland and Silesia. So the odor brings quite a lot of uh, hazardous substances already coming to Germany. But nevertheless we have also some additional uh, work to do. And we cannot start in Germany to uh, come to a clean-up of the Oda. We have to start in Silesia, but with money and with technical support of Germany. Thank you. So we could notice that the, uh, the German Minister of Environment mentions access to clean drinking water as the number one environmental problem in eastern Germany and in the region of Oder, or Odra, as it's being said in Polish. Um, Odra is... Uh, one of the two main rivers in uh, Poland, as we know, and Wisła, or Vistula is the other one, and we will see what's going on in Vistula. W roku ruszyła budowa mechaniczno-biologicznej oczyszczalni ścieków. Last year, the construction of the wastewater treatment plant has been started, which should solve one of the main problems of the Vistula water protection in Krakow. It will be a complete biological wastewater treatment plant which will be able to comply with the European water quality standards after the year 2000. 
It means that together with the high degree of removal of organic pollutants, also nitrogen and phosphorus will be removed. Technology is based on a specially developed biological reactor in which nitrification and denitrification processes are taking place. Also, biological and chemical removal of phosphorus will be carried out, setting higher standards enforcing removal of nutrients from wastewater is part of the environmental protection project of the Baltic. The project had been set up during the Helsinki Convention, signed also by Poland. Last year, 35 billion zlotys, which is equivalent to over 3 million dollars, have been spent on the construction of the plant. The total cost is estimated for about 40 million US dollars. It is really a huge cost in relation to the potential of Polish economy. For the last two years, we have in Poland the National Fund for Environmental Protection, which grants loans for ecological projects. The loans have not only relatively low interest rates, but also a possibility of their conversion. However, the city council has not agreed to take loans, and in this situation it is the steel mill which will do it and will complete the construction. The reason for this is that the steel mill has problems with using the Vistula water for cooling purposes. It has been therefore determined to examine possibilities of tertiary wastewater treatment in the so-called water reclamation processes and using reused water for cooling purposes. Such method of carrying out the project and utilization of the wastewater will bring the steel mill serious economic profits and will protect the Vistula River water at the same time. The wastewater treatment plant treated wastewater from Nova Huta and the steel mill is part of the program FAIR 91, what means that there will be a financial help for the project. For the time being, it is a technical assistance. A well-known European company, Krüger from Denmark, in cooperation with the design office of municipal constructions, the author of the wastewater treatment plant, are now preparing new technological solution of sludge treatment. It is to be based on Western equipment. An investor will have about 7 million US dollars to spend in the next stage. If everything goes well, we are going to have a plant that will meet high European standards. It means implementation of the most modern technologies, low running costs and high standards of environmental protection of the Vistula River. The steel mill will reuse water, the production costs will go down and wet quenching of coke will be abandoned, improving air quality. It is estimated that it is possible to put the wastewater management fully in order in Poland and to meet the West European water quality standards at the cost of 200 billion of zlotys, it is 20 billion US dollars over 25 years. It is until year 2020. Maybe by that time, water clean as it is in this stream will be found in all Polish rivers. I understand, Ella, that this construction that's going on in Krakow is one of the largest in Poland. Yes, just now. It's the largest mm. one. Mm. You have several such uh, buildings, building of treatment plants going on? Or? Yes, a few just started. Mm. So this is the main task you have ahead of you, building the plants? Yes, and by this way, uh, mm. and by the end uh, 1995, it is planned uh, the reduction of not treated wastewater of about 25% uh, uh, in the country scale. Mm -hmm. And by this way, it will be possible uh, the reduction of the pollution load uh, uh, carried out into the Baltic Sea, uh, directly or through the rivers, uh, mainly Odra and Vistula, uh, Viswa, mm -hmm. and the tributaries, uh, and of course, coastal rivers. Mm -hmm. And a program uh, proposed by uh, the Ministry of the Environmental Protection says about 15% of reduction for BOD mm -hmm. and uh, about 4.5% uh, reduction for nitrogen. Mm -hmm. 
And that will be the year 19... 1995. Mm -hmm. That's the plans. Well, we all hope that you will yeah. succeed in that. Now, yes. I know that there is a lot of uh, international cooperation going on, not least with the World Bank, but also between individual cities, companies, and so on. And yes. Gunilla, you have one such cooperation with... Yes, uh, Stockholm is one example mm -hmm. in, in this way. And uh, we have a cooperation project uh, with uh, the Water and Wastewater Works in Warsaw. In, oh yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and the task is uh, to complete the sewage treatment plant in Warsaw, uh, which uh, serves about, about uh, half of the city of Warsaw with uh, sewage treatment and equipment for the watering of sludge. And uh, the project is uh, financed by mutual assistance uh, from the Swedish BITS. Mm -hmm. It's a Swedish governmental financing organization for mm -hmm. international technical assistance. Mm -hmm. And uh, w what is the goal of that? When will the plant be in operation? Uh, we hope it will be in operation in, uh, I will say, the end of 1993. Mm -hmm. So you see there's a lot of things going on in terms of constructing wastewater treatment plants in many places around, not least Poland. But there is also a discussion going on how to perhaps go into some other concepts than traditional wastewater uh, treatment. And we will finally uh, show a few of these new approaches or perhaps very old approaches in some cases. And the first one uh, is in the area of ecological techniques. And one such uh, ecological technique is the wetland treatment. The new wetlands may be of many different kinds. As a general measure, 10 to 20 meter wide green buffer corridors should be created along streams and rivers. In these, nutrient reduction will take place in both surface water and groundwater. Different wetlands like ponds, reed swamps, swamp forest, flooded meadows, mires, etc may be created within these green corridors. The nitrogen eliminating processes which are active in wetlands or sedimentation of nitrogen containing particles, uh, plant assimilation and denitrification. The sedimentation of particles is improved if rapidly running water of streams or from drain pipes is led into wide wetland areas where the water movement is slowed down. By sediment sedimentation, nitrogen then will be stored for longer or shorter periods of time. Plant assimilation is depending on the contact between the water transported nutrients and the roots of the macrophytes. Therefore, the wetlands should be designed, be designed in a way that allows water to percolate into the ground and continuously flow through the root zone. The third process, denitrification, is a bacterial process by which nitrate is transformed to nitrogen gas. Denitrification takes place in most waterlogged soils and sediments. It is enhanced by high nitrate levels in the incoming water and high organic content, which is easily decomposable for bacteria in the wetland soils. Also, plants may enhance denitrification by their root metabolism. It should be remembered that only by denitrification the nitrogen is finally eliminated from the hydro and biosphere and returned to the atmosphere. Then, how efficiently can wetlands eliminate nitrogen from the water? Scientific investigations show a wide range from, around, from about 10 kilograms nitrogen per hectare a year to 2 to 3,000 kilograms. At present, it seems as if ponds and reed swamps are the most efficient wetlands. But even marshes and flooded wetlands show high nitrogen removing potential. However, it should be remembered that our knowledge of nitrogen elimination in wetlands is still very limited. Therefore, 500 kilograms per hectare and year has been suggested as a reliable figure to be used by planners. Hmm. Bank, is wetland techniques important or will it be important in the future? I think it's important. It's not used so very much today, but it will, will be increased. And both by natural wetlands and artificial wetlands. But we need to know more about the processes. Mm. And many countries have wetlands today mm. and they could perhaps use it much more. We have 
reduce the amounts of wetlands in natural. Sweden. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, but in Poland, for example, there are quite an impressive area with the wetlands. Yeah. Mm. Now, um, there are other ways of using ecological techniques, and one we will see a few pictures from only is from Sten Sund. A folk college, very close to here in fact. They have built an interesting plant. You see the Baltic Sea in the background here, and here you see the plant. And we will see how this plant is constructed. Uh, it's inside the uh, hothouse there, so to speak, like in the glass. Uh, what do you say, Bengt? What's going on here? Yes, well, uh, several treatment steps. One is, for instance, an uh, anaerobic step to remove metals, aerobic step to remove organics, a basing with phytoplankton and bacteria, and uh, also a basing with zooplankton. And the and interesting part here is, of course, that the land. Uh, yes, it's mm -hmm. a polyculture basing with both fish and crayfish and plants, and that's a part of aquaculture technology. Mm -hmm. And this here we see plants, and they can be used both for production of compost, biogas, and for energy. Mm -hmm. What about the capacity of such a, uh, a treatment plant? Uh, it's needed much more space than in our uh, in a traditional wastewater treatment. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so you, do you think this will be of importance? Maybe of importance in the future, but today mm -hmm. there's a lot of problems mm -hmm. to uh, solve this in a technical economical way. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. If we go into uh, industry, one, one of the things that's going on, as far as I understand, is um, a saving of water. Uh, do you have a comment on this, water saving methods? Yes, so that's the thing that one should start with, to save water. But it's also important to separate waste streams and uh, all these things to also change production. Technology can be summarized mm. as clean technology. Mm. And we went to the Swedish Institute for Environmental Research and asked the director, Lars Gunnar Lindfors, about his opinion on uh, what could be the use of clean technology. I'd say that the, the future trend will be to try to close up the processes on the water side as far as possible. Mm -hmm. and the ultimate goal is 100%, that is wastewater-free processes. Mm -hmm. And uh, today we have the... the technology to do that, uh, separation technology, you use quite often then a separation technologies as a sort of kidney, a kidney function within the process, removing the pollutants in the concentrated form and recirculating the water. And the technology for that is available today, mm -hmm. but uh, we do not know enough of the process, what will happen if we recirculate water, accumulating perhaps pollutants in the process. We don't know enough in order to be able to, to solve every problem. In mm -hmm. But in some areas, it might have come to a closed circle, more or less. Yes, more well, or less. Um, does this have an importance today, Bengt? Yes, the, uh, uh, mm? it's very important uh, because that is the starting point for all the industrial production to try to close uh, the production chain and to uh, mm -hmm. don't uh, add wastes to uh, uh, or solid waste is or to, uh, to waste mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. So, and um, one thing he said, not here, is that uh, f for pure economical reasons, it was quite important to uh, diminish the amount of wastewater. It's too expensive to, to clean wastewater simply, so the best thing is not to produce it at all. Uh, what about uh, the municipal field? Do you think uh, these advanced techniques like membrane technologies will have a future there too? Yes, I do think the membrane process will be interesting uh, in, for the municipal wastewater treatment in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you could say, a way of taking away the last part of the chemical oxygen de demand substances, mm -hmm. e.g. the unspecified organic substances that we are uh, discharging today. Mm -hmm. But that will I mean, be uh, beyond the year 2000. Beyond the year 2000, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, another approach is, of course, not to uh, produce the waste in the first place, but actually reduce it at the source. And we got one contribution from Luleå Institute of Technology by Peter Sandström, and we'll see what he says on that point. What could be achieved by using the strategy sorting at source or at the origin? 
First, phosphorus-free detergents would reduce the total phosphorus load by about 40%. Second, separating urine would then reduce the load of phosphorus, nitrogen and other nutrients by about 85 to 90 percent. Third, separating both urine and feces has a minor extra effect on recovery but reduces pathogens in wastewater with a factor of 10,000. Fourth, using toilets with tight flushing for urine saves about 20 percent of the total water consumption, or about 40 liters per person per day. An example of technique that separates both urine and feces is the Volgus toilet. By recycling urine to cultivation, 85 to 90 percent of the nutrients in human excrements is reduced. An equal amount of new nutrients in form of commercial fertilizers don't have to be introduced into the system. As a matter of fact, the composition of nutrients in urine is close to the requirements of most plants. Gunilla, what's your comment on this? As uh, being uh, responsible for the water supply to Stockholm, will it be of importance in urban areas or rural areas? You mean for uh, sewage treatment? Mm. Well, for yes. the water management. Mm. Yes, for the water management. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting technique. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, the idea is uh, quite right to closing the cycles and to get nutrients back to land again. Mm -hmm. That's important. And uh, I think it uh, can be used in the future for uh, small villages and uh, in uh, rural areas. Mm -hmm. But uh, I imagine there are great problems if you uh, try to introduce these systems in heavily populated areas mm. with so millions of people. So it's not much people. for urban areas in the future? I don't no. think so. Mm. Thank you. Um, we have here with us uh, Nils Tiberg, who is a professor mm. at the department where um, Peter Sandström is. And Nils is going to be the coordinator for session number 10 in two weeks, so we will let him have the chance to say a few words. Please, Nils. Uh, the name of this session will be the prospect of a sustainable society. And we will uh, regard the whole industrial society and the environmental impact of the whole society. And from that viewpoint, it may be that the solutions will come out differently. I think it will be interesting and uh, you are welcome on the 13th of May. Mm -hmm. And with these words, I also would like to say thank you to today's panels, to all the students and uh, teachers listening to us, and we will see you again in two weeks. Here's a little song I wrote You might want to hear it Not for not to don't worry I'll be happy In every life we have some trouble But when you worry you make it double Don't worry I'll be happy Don't worry, be happy